and with uh, Charlie Brown and Busta Rhymes, of course, Busta Rhymes ended up becoming a hugely successful star and still is. Right. But with Charlie Brown, I actually thought from Leaders, he was the one that was going to be the star of Leaders because he had a very distinctive style of rapping. Right. But beyond that, he had such personality, just like Buster. His was just different. Right. So for you, um, what... Was it, what did you like about what Charlie Brown did on the mic or what he was as an artist? I kind, I kind of felt like they was like me a little bit. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like, they didn't hang out with Cube. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they didn't hang out with Chuck. You know, Chuck and Cube hung out, but me and Charlie Brown hung out because they kind of remind me of me. Like, if I was in New York, I felt like I, I could have been in Leaders of the New School. Mm, you know, because okay. I, I had... Uh, I mean, we were just the same. I mean, they didn't, they didn't have to be my friend. You know, I, I stand out in the front. They was always laughing at me because I had a remote control car. Okay. And how do you play with a remote control car in the snow? I don't know. But it was amazing. <laughs> they loved it. So they would come out and see me with the remote control car. And then we just all became friends. Even a uh, shout out to Rob, you know, Epitome. Mm. Now, he was there, you know, so he knew them. And then we all became, you know, pretty much the same age. So uh, we we just became cool, and they come hang out and and chill. And Chuck D had one side of the church, and you go down, and then on the other side they had three cubicles. So in the middle cubicle, leaders of the new school had they little uh, like a cubicle to do their music in. Okay. So whenever we go out, you know, get some fresh air or something, we'll run into each other. So they had a crew. They had a whole bunch of people around them, so it was always just all love. It was just real love dealing with them. Gotcha. So then, with America's Most Wanted, as you, you know, coming back to LA, and then the album comes out and it's hugely successful. What, from what you know, why and how did Kill It Will come about in the way that it did with having some remixes that you did, but mm-hmm. then also having new songs? Like, what was that? I don't, Cube was just, we was on one, man. That was okay. just that, that new energy. And um, uh, he just wanted to do a, a EP. And uh, he wanted to do a, a, a remix to Endangered Species. Okay. I, I, I don't, I, you would have to talk to Cube about it. But I was just ready to work. And, 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 I, and I could do it. So, And they, he trusted me without them. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So... That was kind of like my debut with, uh, I think, is the uh, product. I think, and um, and Jack and for Beats. I think yeah. was 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 the, you know, dinner. Are you ready? <laughs> Ice Cube coming at you with another moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to be all everybody, you know, at that time, but. Uh, the the Jack the, and for the Beats. Jinx Squad, <laughs> yeah, the, sorry Jinx, yeah. The the Jack and for Beats was supposed to be a, a diss towards N.W.A., but nobody got it. Mm. So I think he was trying to respond to them, do Endangered Species, and do because um, you can't fade me. And some of those songs were short songs on America's Most, so we kind of extended them and right. made them into into new songs. But most of those songs were just paying for the publishing for Jack and for Beats because. Jack and the Beats was very expensive. To, and we're going to get to Jack and the Beats in a second. But for you, since at that point you had already produced on America's Most Wanted, and then mm-hmm. you've been in CIA, by the time you get to Kill It Will as a remixer, mm-hmm. what what did you? How did you approach doing something as a remix as opposed to say Jack and for Beats or the product or something like that? That's an original song. Well, being a a, a producer, uh, how I've, a, a DJ, mm-hmm. uh, uh, most remixing guys are dope DJs. So to know how to keep it in key and, and keep the beat and the rap in the same beat pattern, you know, that's how I was able to do remixes. You know, because before that, uh, I was um, working with a lady named Karen Jones and. Uh, and this this little guy, little he's not that big. It's, I think his name is Benny Medina. But uh, <laughs> I was working he's with him. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's kind of famous. Yeah, well, he's kind yeah, of famous. It's, he, he got a little name for himself, but uh, he he cared about me, and uh, and I was working with him, and uh, they gave me um, a bunch of remixes with Trey Lude and. 
Trelude is uh, George Clinton's son. Mm -hmm. So during those days, and, and you know, shout out to Mike Conception. Mike Conception brought me up there to to, to uh, meet Karen and be with Warner Brothers and stuff like that. But when I started doing remixes, then they start paying me to do remixes. So to do Cube's remixes, that came later, you know. So I was just already, you know, you know, I already knew how to be in the studio, you know, at that time, to be able to change music and make it my way or, you know, just make it good enough for the rapper to like. Okay. And then on Jack and for Beats, one of the things that I always thought was interesting was the sonics of it, of course, with Jack and the Beats or taking the beats. But I also thought it was interesting that people, I think, that aren't in the game don't really understand uh writing and i know dell obviously wrote some of that co-wrote it worked with cube writing it what have you so on that song in particular do you remember how dell and cube were working and how mm -mm. did no mm -mm. they you know they cousins so it, like i said everybody was doing what they was doing and I actually was in the studio working on the product, I think that's the name. At the time? Right. Okay. So one of my buddies that I was working with, Chili Chill, I had brought Chili Chill in because mm -hmm. me and Chili Chill used to do mixtapes all the time. Chili Chill was dope at making mixtapes like mm -hmm. back in the day. So I was like, well, I'm going to book this room out and you do it. You do Jack of Beats. That's why his name is in there. Right. Um, Chili Chill make the track, track move, move because he was supposed to produce the track, but when we got to it, I think I gave him too much room, and he and he kind of did it like a mixtape, and the tempos were changing. Mm. So a long time ago, you know, I learned from Dr. Dre. You know, shout out to Steve Yano and the Rhodium and all that. I learned from that. So a lot of that came to make Jack and for Beat. So when you're making a track like that, it needs a bottom track. Right. But you can take the bottom track out. Right. But he was just making the track like a mixtape. And it was kind of all over the place a little. And then I went back in and then I changed it. And then I made it the way I wanted to. He was still there. But I didn't I didn't take his name out of it. I, I always left his name there because we was working together. So. Right. But it was, it was a mixtape effort, knowing how to do the four track mixes and stuff like that. Okay. And then why why do you think people make such a big deal if a rapper writes a song with somebody else or works with someone and as a producer it doesn't seem to matter but why do you think people make such a big deal if someone writes a song or has it written for them or well i mean everybody looks at rap at me and real mm -hmm. they they, li they like you because they like who you are mm -hmm. now at the end of the day you come up to me and you threaten me and then i look in your ear and somebody's telling you how to threaten me, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to take it like, like that, you okay. know? So, um, when, when, when people write other rappers raps, sometimes it takes away from you believing who that rapper is, mm -hmm. you know? But, uh, if it doesn't take away from the rapper or makes him be something he's not. So with Dale writing or, or assisting, I, I would say, um, I don't think it took away from nothing, but because we what we not in that field, you know, and Dale is not like that. Dale was helping out, you know, so with Q letting him, you know, write a couple things, I think it was just boosting his writing skills because he, he knew how to write very well. Yeah, it's and to write out of his. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that—that that wasn't what Dell did. I mean, you right. heard what Dell do. So for him to write in that category, it was—it was always, you know, for him to even be accepted, it, it was dope. It yeah. had to be dope. Yeah, and that's something that I've always thought was amazing. Uh, obviously, working with you on Yo Yo's album too, mm -hmm. around the same time or before. But I just think it's amazing that Dell has been not only a part of all these different things, but so many different things. Like right. he's doing the gorillas, Deltron himself, right. Yo Yo, Ice Cube. He's just a phenomenal dude. Too. I remember Dale when I was like working with this girl and um Dale used to 
I give him a beat. I, I don't give him a beat. He get his own beat because we it wasn't like that. So we'll pick up pick up like Friends or or Pee Wee Herman or, or a beat that I will know the tempo will be the same. Okay. So he'll put a headphone on and wrap it to my answering service, and then I'll take the tape out and put it to the same beat and give it to give it to the artist. Oh wow. So this is how me and Dale was working. Like we was working back to back to back. And and the funny thing is, um, when I said that once upon a time in the projects, that was um Tajay and Adam. So mm. from Souls of Mischief. Like mm-hmm. they was my group, they was called Rhythm at first, you know. So we was all working. Everybody was just, you know, I think they was fourteen, fifteen at the time. But uh they we was all working. So we made a process to be able to, to to give other people music and then they can be able to change it if they want to but we just made like a process like a, a foundation like a blueprint and then kept going you know what i'm saying so cube did that a lot too and that's adam a plus carter right yes for those that yeah right tajay and adam yeah it was around yeah that's crazy and then then we get now we're up to the stuff that came out in 91, even though, of course, some of it had been done uh, long before that. Um, starting with uh, Boys in the Hood, uh, Once Upon a Time in the Projects. Mm-hmm. I mean, How to Survive in South Central, excuse me. Right. With How to Survive in South Central, with that song, why do you think that that didn't end up on one of the other uh, Killer Will or America's Most? I think it was a valley part because we did another song with John Singleton too on mm-hmm. the higher learning track that, right and then we did looters uh, no was it called trespass or something like that well it was called looters originally right and right. then it became trespass but they bought them songs oh all at the same right. time no they bought and we most of the time back in them days they would pay you oh, they, to do the song outright so right and they, and they own the song they you know they get your publishing or whatever off of it but they 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 buy it they mm-hmm. like do this like the, I got the most money for the looters track or whatever, the, the trespass, trespass, because it was him and Ice T, right? Mm-hmm. And one time Cube says something like, uh, "Your head a bust like, uh, I don't know, like uh, JFK or something." And it was like, "Whoa." <laughs> Might want to change that. <laughs> so every time we went back in, they paid us again to do the song. And then when the riots happened, they changed it from looters to trespass. So I mean, I got so much money to do that song. That's the worst song to me. I heard it a couple of, like a year ago, but it, it it was so watered down by the time the people got it. I was like, uh, it's okay. But uh, the first version was better when it was looters. Wow. But they kept paying us, I think, 15000 every time we went yeah. back in to change it. That's but at least me, I don't know what Q got. He probably yeah. got a little more than that. And Ice-T. I was going to say, that's <laughs> that's three of y'all getting, getting extra paper. Every time they wanted something changed. It's like, if you want to change it, pay us to change it. But uh, with uh, how, um, how to Survive in South Central, we, that was just the soundtrack for Boys in the Hood because we was you know, around it. And that happened after mm-hmm. we was in the movie, well, we did the movie. So we just kind of went in the studio one weekend and kind of came up with it because I had beats all day, like, you know, like a whole, you know, refrigerator full, right. of, full of juices, you know, and <laughs> Cuba going there and... and, and and if he don't have, if I don't have it, then you know, Pooh will step up, or you know, Rashad, mm-hmm. you know, uh, different people will step up. But um, you know, like Pooh did, uh, today was a good day. But Q came to me with that idea, so it's just depending on whose beat he liked the most at the time. So he liked that beat, and uh, I liked it too, of course. And that, that's how how to survive was made. And then looking back, because. A, rap is very powerful, but, of course, people like their visuals, too, and movies right. are as well. Looking back, why do you think Boys in the Hood is such an important film and that How to Survive in South Central is such a big song? It was the time, man. I mean, it was speaking for the people, you know, and that was like Cube's first song he wrote for someone that ended up being a big song. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, if you... Look at the movie. I mean, Eric could have been uh, 
Doughboy. Doughboy too, you know. Right. I, if, if he would have wanted, I mean, Eric didn't know how to rap, and he ended up learning how to rap real good. So he could have done it. I mean, it was just all of us was, you know, kind of living that life, and we was the voice for the West Coast because the East Coast was making a name for theyself, and it was very visual for the East Coast guys. And uh, they never seen nothing like that before. You know, they used to laugh at Jerry Curls and the way we used to dress. And, uh, you know, used to say, you know, y'all tripping over red and blue. What a stupid idea, you know. But when they saw the movie, then they was like, oh, it's a little bit different than how we're perceiving it through the media. And they start taking Los Angeles a lot more serious after that and Minister Society, I think. Right. That's why it was so important for people to see how the West Coast is through our eyes rather than seeing how it is through um, the actual, the media or the magazines or however they was trying to portray Los Angeles. Well, I think that's important to people to understand because I talk about this in my book, The History of Gangsta Rap, but even the Ghetto Boys in like 89 on Do It Like a Geo, they mm-hmm. were talking about how New York wouldn't play their records. Right. And then... Most people don't <clears throat> understand, appreciate, or want to acknowledge it, but like Bigger and Deffer by LL was produced by the LA Posse, DJ right. Pooh, Bobcat. I mean, so there had long been this collaboration and this stuff going on, but the media or however people want to look at it didn't acknowledge it. So for you, talking with Buster Rhymes, Charlie Brown, getting in with Bomb Squad and stuff, how did you? Did you feel anything when you were out there? Or did, was no. it so? No. What? So it's how, probably the losers. Well, you know, losers look for reasons to hate, and right. and then for New York to be able to give us a beautiful thing called hip hop. Some people didn't take it. You know, they 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 didn't want us to have it. They 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 said that that wasn't hip hop. Like what we was doing wasn't hip hop. But the new guys that was doing East Coast rap, they were changing too. So they absolutely they were evolving as well. So the Public people, Enemy didn't sound nothing like Treacherous Three. I'll tell you that no. much. Or Cold Crush. Right, right, <laughs> right. So it's a lot of the people. Just like right now, you see a lot of dudes say the rappers right now ain't real rap. You know, because it is it's involved. It's involved evolving, and people are getting along that rap the same way. Like, you have a New York mumble rapper, you got a down south mumble rapper, all the people mumble rapping now. Yeah. It ain't it ain't like East Coast, West Coast, because now the haters don't have a bullhorn. They don't have, they can't right. talk no more. You know, you can't bring that beef into the East Coast, West Coast. It was no East Coast, West Coast beef. The only thing it was was the East Coast people on the radio wasn't giving us the same thing that West Coast was giving the East Coast. Right. So when we get to New York, they only play your record when you're there, mm. you know, and then we, you know, of course, that'll make you mad. You selling millions of records and y'all have an issue with this. So and once those people got out, then the beef was done. And then the East Coast guys had love. The Florida guys, you know, came in, you know, the Memphis dudes come in, the Houston dudes, you know, everybody start getting the same kind of love when it came to being accessible. You know, at first, we West Coast wasn't accessible. You had to kind of have an East Coast vibe and sneak in for them to like you. But then later, we find out that a lot of the dudes in New York didn't feel that way. They was right. like, nah, that was dude. I like Ice Cube. <laughs> yeah. I like Dr. Dre. You know, I like Snoop Dogg. So most of the people back then that had the bullhorn was just saying some real bullshit over it. Yeah. Because I, I often wondered about that. It just seemed like... Of course, like with most things in life, people sometimes pay attention to the wrong people. And well, it's it, it, whoever talks loudest sometimes yeah. get the get their point across. And sometimes the victor is not the right person. You know right. what I'm saying? The person that wins might be terrible, you know, in a, in, a, in a fighting situation. You feel me? So once that person got old and their views wasn't being looked at the same way and everybody was judging you on your quality, your lyrics, how good your music is, how you stick to the topic. You got good hooks. And that's everybody. That That's just not New York. That's that. that Nah, New right. York didn't even have that. West Coast brought that, right? At least to me. I mean, you had fat, fat boys. I mean, they did have stuff like that, but it wasn't Snoop Dogg. You know, we brought like the baseline. I say they brought the rap. West Coast brought the music. Down South brought the hooks. Hmm. Interesting. They got they had the bomb hooks. 
Yeah, they do. Still, still do. <laughs> still do. Still do. <laughs> still do. But as um as you're going in '91, you also work with Yo Yo, of course, who you've right. been working with for a long time. And one of the things I thought was um very interesting about the album, like we had had with you know Boogie Down Productions with Jimmy, for instance, she had to put a lid on a song talking about mm-hmm. safe sex, mm-hmm. and uh, Ice Cube in his own way had talked about uh, how to not get girls pregnant in many different ways but for you as a producer and you working with Yo-Yo what did you um, like why and how does a song like that that's promoting safe sex that's thoughtful and all these different things how does that fit into the world that you were in at the time and I give, I'm, I'm like a chameleon when it comes to seeing what's inside of people. You know, I don't give a, a person a cake mix. And I didn't, we didn't want Yo-Yo, <clears throat> we didn't want Yo-Yo to be a gangster girl rapper. You know, we wanted her to kind of have a voice for, for all the girls, you know, just not for the girls that are gangsters. So a lot of the topics that we were trying to choose for the record was based on her being IBWC, Intelligent Black Woman Coalition, you know, trying to stay in that thing because it was very hard for a woman to kick a little knowledge. So it was almost like trying to do like like a gospel song with just a little cursing in it, you know, just like a little <laughs> cursing in it, but it's still a gospel song and it still have a message to it, but we still had to make it rough a little bit. But uh, we, we definitely wanted her to uh, have what well, she wanted, you know, she wanted it to be uh, like hard but once you listen to it, it it kicks a little message to it so we that's that's why she got a record deal in the beginning hip-hop was ruled by the east coast then the west coast rose to prominence thanks to gangster rap hip-hop changed the world Gangster rap changed the narrative. I'm representing for the gangsters all across the world. And then changed the world again. Cause I'll come and take your life away. The history of gangster rap features unheard stories, unseen photos and documents, all with exclusive interviews from the founders and players who shape gangster rap. I think a real gangster rapper has to scare you a little bit. The history of gangster rap written by veteran rap journalist Soren Baker. In stores now. Yo, what up? This is DJ Quick. Be sure to pick up my homeboy Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap, if you really want to know what we do. 